Right, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 24th meeting in 2014 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome members? Hope we all had an uh, enjoyable and restful recess. Uh, can I welcome our witnesses, who we'll introduce in a moment, and uh, visitors joining us in the gallery. And I can remind everyone, please, to turn off, or at least turn to silent, all uh, mobile phones and other uh, electrical devices. Uh, we have apologies this morning from uh, Richard Baker and Dennis Robertson, and we have Stuart and Maxwell joining us as a substitute. Just, oh. just clarify, it's for Dennis Robertson. I'm joining as a substitute, not for Richard Baker. Thank you. I think we probably worked that one out for ourselves, but thank you for clarifying that. Okay, item one on the agenda. Are members content that we take items three and four in private? Yes, agreed. Thank you, that's agreed. Item uh, two on the agenda, we are continuing our draft budget scrutiny for uh, the Scottish Government's 2015-2016 budget. Uh, we have two panels uh, this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome our first panel uh, from Visit Scotland. We have Malcolm Ruffhead, Chief Executive, and Ken Nielsen, Director of Corporate Services. Welcome to you both. Uh, before we get into questioning, gentlemen, uh, is something you'd like to say briefly by way of uh, introduction? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, just a few words, I, I think, just to bring the, the committee up to date on the year so far. No doubt we'll, we'll get into that uh, in more detail, but I think everyone would agree that in uh, 2014 it's been uh, and continues to be a fantastic year for Scottish tourism. Uh, if you think about the Commonwealth Games, tremendous success and a, and a tribute to the volunteers, the organisers and the people of Glasgow, uh, which was followed by an equally impressive Ryder Cup at uh, Glen Eagles. And there's no doubt that uh, Scotland has raised, raised the bar in delivering these major sporting events, demonstrating, I believe, that not only do we have the, the capability and capacity to deliver such events, but we also have the credibility to continue to be ambitious and to bid for more. And you may have seen recent announcements uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, uh, around the, the football championships and other uh, sporting events uh, that Glasgow in particular has put bids in for. The international media that followed and has been throughout the year has, has been astonishing. Uh, and obviously what we will do is we will bring to you the full economic results once they are uh, ready uh, in spring of next year. Also, just a, a very quick update, and I know we will be bringing you a full report on homecoming. But uh, to date, uh, by the end of September, uh, the homecoming programme, which has over a thousand events throughout the whole year, has seen over a million visitors to those events, which I think uh, is a great tribute to the event organisers uh, and the industry which, which hosts uh, these visits. Um, 2014 is obviously the, the culmination of Visit Scotland's work with the industry, the so-called winning years that five-year programme, and is very much the, the catalyst for the next five to ten years. Uh, so it's very much about building on the platform that, that has been created uh, over that, that period of time. And I think it's, it's also worth saying that in terms of the budget, uh, and we may go into that in some more detail, but uh, we are very pleased with, with the outcome. We have been able to build on the successes to date and uh, I look forward to outlining how we do that in due course. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ruffhead. Um, uh, we've got about an hour for this session, um, uh, but uh, even though we have some time, I would ask members if they would keep their questions short and to the point, and uh, responses uh, as brief and to the point would, would be helpful just in terms of getting through the, 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 the topics. And I'll just remind members, our focus clearly is the Scottish Government's budget, although I appreciate, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll stray into other areas. Um, can, can I maybe just start off, off Mr. Ruffhead, by picking up, um, you know, on your last point? Um, you know, we've had the, the, the winning years strategy, which has now come to an end. I mean, are you confident, you know, looking at, at the years ahead, that you can maintain the momentum uh, that's been established? And, you know, do you feel that uh, the budget uh, allocations from the Scottish Government are giving you the resource to, to enable you to, to do that? Well, if I take the, the issue around momentum, I think next year, I um, want us to remember, it's a question that's oft asked, uh, and, and naturally so, given the, the unique uh, nature of this year. But next year, we, we already have a number of world championships which uh, will take place. 
Uh, we have the World Orienteering Championships, uh, we have the World Mountain Bike Championships, we also have European events which, which will be taking place next year as well and uh, for the first time we'll be hosting the Turner Prize. Uh, that's not all, there are other activities and clearly uh, in terms of bidding for such events the, the gestation period can be up to about eight to ten years so there's a lot of work that's already underway to make sure you know, that, that we continue to build on the event's legacy that, that's left behind. In terms of the business tourism side, similar uh, to events, it's about bidding in advance. And uh, I'm delighted to say that the business uh, tourism bid fund that we introduced uh, just over two years ago uh, for an outlay of a million pounds has generated almost 110 million pounds of conferencing business uh, for over the next sort of five to six years. So those, those are very strong uh, foundations for us to build on. And, and also, if you look at the, uh, the amount of um, uh, aviation access that, that, that we've secured over the last sort of 12 to 18 months, that allows us to build on that as well to make sure that, that people can get here quickly and easily and conveniently. Okay, and just on on the budget issue, I mean, in terms of budget support, um, you're, you're you feel that you're, you're getting the support you need from Scottish government. Yes, uh, as a, a former marketeer, I can say now uh, you always want more, but I think you know, given the, the circumstances that that we're in, it's a very good outcome for uh, Visit Scotland. Clearly, there is no homecoming next year, so you know that disappears from the budget. There's no Ryder Cup as well that disappears. So the net effect is five million pounds of an increase which will allow us to build on uh, the aviation uh, and also the, the success of, of the events platform. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll bring in Mike McKenzie, who I think has got a similar, similar line of question. Uh, well, not, not, not identical, uh, convener, but uh, <coughs> one of the, the areas I was uh, keen to explore was that we had quite a bit of talk and discussion, I think with yourself, uh, Malcolm, uh, prior to, uh, for instance, the Commonwealth Games, uh, to see if um, lessons had been learned from the Olympics to the extent that that acted as a suction machine and sucked the tourism benefit out of the rest of the country. And I think, uh, you know, uh, Visit Scotland made efforts to see that that didn't happen with the Commonwealth Games and Ryder Cup and so on. Is it, you know, too soon to have any analysis, any understanding of whether or not that strategy was successful? It's a very good point, and, and it was indeed one of the lessons learned from the Olympics. Uh, what, what we will be doing in the full report is just uh, highlighting exactly where the common accommodation spread was felt, and, and there's some indicative numbers coming through uh, from the Commonwealth Games, which shows just how far that ripple effect was. Uh, the Ryder Cup, and it's only anecdotal at this stage, and there'll be a full report, but there certainly was evidence that, that people pre the Ryder Cup and post the Ryder Cup we're, we're actually going out around the country playing the various different courses that, that are, are available. Uh, I think the, the interesting aspect about um, the, the major events, and I know the Highlands, for example, uh, some of the numbers uh, have been variable up there, but I think that's also because they, they lost Rock Ness um, and uh, Castle Stewart, of course, which hosted the Scottish Open last year, didn't host it this year. So in and of itself, that's about 100,000 visitors that went missing this year, if you like, in that particular region. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the, the other thing, and this is again a kind of old theme of mine, um, is that, um, you, you know, I, I would contend there's a lot of low-hanging fruit uh, to be picked uh, that sometimes gets missed as we reach for the bigger looking fruit on the top branches. And um, the, uh, I mean, I know in your submission that you talk a bit about exports and the committee are doing a, you know, have a focus on experts, uh, exports this year. And, you know, it, it seems to be the case that most of our exports arise from a very small number of pretty big businesses and not much uh, from smaller businesses. And, of course, the area I represent, Highlands and Islands, tends to consist mainly of smaller businesses. So this is, in a sense, linked to my previous question. Given that your increased net budget, um, given that there aren't those big-ticket events coming forward in the future, do you feel there's some scope for uh, more focus on picking some of this low-hanging fruit that I'm happy to wax lyrical about for the next, the remainder of this session with the convener's indulgence. Um, but do you think you could maybe um, uh, apply some focus to some of the lower-hanging fruit in the Highlands and Islands? 
I think the, the, the platform already exists, uh, and that's visitscotland.com. Uh, we have 9,000 listings, many actually from the Highlands, and it, it currently generates 2 million referrals to businesses uh, that are listed on the website. But there's 8% conversion of those 2 million referrals. So the issue is not necessarily about do we have platforms in the reach, the issue is how do we upskill people so that they can take advantage of the business that's already there and convert that you know, to, to their own profit. And that's one of the themes that we'll be taking forward with our colleagues in the enterprise, in the enterprise companies and also uh, in Business Gateway, which is partly in response to the FSB report that came out recently about helping people to take advantage in, in a digital age. And, and do you feel, um, I, I'm struck when I travel across the Highlands and Islands that, that some areas are very good at tourism and get a, capture a huge economic benefit. Orkney is the one that springs to mind. And there are other areas where you, they're just not as good at capturing that benefit. Um, is there any role or do you think you could uh, you know, allocate resources towards sharing the knowledge that's been perhaps hard won in, in areas like, like Orkney um, you know, with other areas like Argyll that are not so uh, able to capture the, the full economic benefit available? Yes, I think that we, we already do. Uh, we have what we call an outreach programme, and, and the programme generally is um, created and devised by the local areas themselves. So we're more than happy you know, to, to assist. Uh, we can even provide workshops, one-to-one uh, -one sessions with people, but I, I guess the, the real focus for the year going ahead, and actually gives us an in to do this, is the food and drink, the year of food and drink. Uh, and you mentioned Argyll has a very strong offering in, in that particular area. Uh, and we've worked very, very closely with the uh, food from Argyll uh, and the destination management groups there. I think part of, the, part of the problem is, of course, you're talking about fairly small groupings. And, you know, they tend to be individual business owners. So it's trying to make sure that we get them together at the right time, that, that suits them, and not when they're busy. Summer, of course, is when they are busy. Uh, so during the winter months is when you'll see us ramp up that particular activity. Yeah, and last, just very brief question, convener. Um, do you feel then, well, you mentioned there, you know, it, it, it tends to be characterised by lots of small businesses. Do you think um, there is scope for um, local authorities, councils, to apply their kind of corporate muscle to achieving better outcomes in collaboration with yourself? I have to say uh, the, the cooperation and, and collaboration and joint planning with local authorities has um, never been as good. Certainly in my time at Visit Scotland, we work very, very closely with them all. We have uh, MOAs with all 32 local authorities across the, across the land. And, and it can vary from marketing through to information provision to uh, looking at, uh, as I say, particular topics that, that are of interest. Or using the national planning framework, it can also look at the, the type of inward investment that's required for that area. I think probably what we have to do, though, is find a way to reach those businesses that can prosper but just haven't ha had the opportunity to do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, to that Sorry, yes, Mr. Nelson, please come in. Yes. Another piece of work that we're currently looking at with, with local authorities and the uh, the enterprise companies is, is looking in depth in tourism in, in a number of areas. We're looking at four just now, which would be uh, Argyll, Dundee, Orkney, North Ayrshire, to see how working in depth we can actually look at this tourism as a, as a growth uh, generator in, in their particular areas. And that's a piece of work that's just, just commencing just now, and we'll be able to report on that as we go forward. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the committee would be very interested to see the results of that. I certainly would. OK, thank you. Um, Patrick, Rudy. Thank you. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> in the budget, we see an additional £5 million pounds to the planned uh, Visit Scotland budget. Uh, and By the way, I should congratulate you on, on the events this year, which have been uh, exemplary, and I think uh, a tribute to all of the Visit Scotland team and others that were involved. The, the plan for the £5 million pounds is to allow further investment in the marketing of existing and new domestic and international uh, air routes. How are you going to do that? We work collaboratively with the airlines. <clears throat> so if you take uh, probably a live example is Qatar, which uh, has just uh, started up. 
from Edinburgh. We sit down with the marketing team for Qatar Airways and we identify the markets, the inbound markets, where the potential that's uh, been identified by the, the airline uh, is greatest and will give us the greatest return uh, on that particular investment. So it's integrated into the, the marketing campaigns that, that we would run. So this year we have in, internationally uh, Meet the Scots, which is the theme for the, the Visit Scotland marketing campaign, and Qatar Airways basically joint, joint match, or match fund uh, that particular activity. Uh, so there'll be a fairly strong emphasis with them in Australia and in Asia. Uh, others that we're planning with is the likes of Etihad, who are due to, to start up uh, next year. Uh, we also work uh, very closely with the likes of Emirates, EasyJet, Ryanair, uh, United Airlines, who have just started out of uh, Chicago, and recently we announced WestJet coming in from Canada. So all of those is about making sure that um, they're sustainable. We don't want one-off hits, so, so they come in and then disappear. So over a, over a period of three to five years, what we look at is, is a joint marketing plan, uh, and we set targets against those in terms of inbound ratios and also in terms of uh, yield and capacity. I think that's very helpful but, uh, in having a marketing plan, but uh, I know in, <coughs> in the submission that you work in very close partnership with uh, Scottish Enterprise and Zion's Enterprise. Uh, <coughs> Who's actually doing the selling? The selling is actually, well, it, it works on two levels. Um, there's the, if you like, there's the planning side of it, which is the team, the aviation team that, that, that you're talking about that's made up of, of the various uh, organisations. And Who that takes, Sorry to interrupt, Malcolm. Mm -hmm. Who takes the lead in that? I mean, uh, how often do you meet? How do you measure oh. the outcomes of what you're planning? Well, we, we meet very frequently, actually. Uh, in fact, we've got a meeting next week coming up. Um, and, and what we do is we identify those routes that, that we think would, would be uh, best suited for Scotland from an inbound tourism and also an investment perspective. So we weight the routes, and, and then, so that allows us to prioritise them. We then identify the airlines that, that can best meet uh, those requirements. And you have the, the major opportunity you have is the Roots Conference, and the one, there's one just taken place recently in Las Vegas, uh, and then the whole team goes out there, but they go out there with the airports, because ultimately the deal maker would be the airport, uh, and the airlines will negotiate with whether it's Edinburgh, Aberdeen, or Glasgow, or Presswick, or whoever it happens to be. Uh, and all we can do is we would offer up the type of support for any uh, airport so, and airline. So it doesn't matter to us, in, in a sense, whether they come to Edinburgh, Glasgow or Aberdeen, or what we're saying is about Scotland or Presswick. So. Yes, I, I, I managed to get through these two questions without mentioning APD, which of course would remove all which would help. The, the, your ambition is to grow visitor spend by £1 billion by 2020. That's the Scottish Tourism Alliance uh, strategy that, that came out a couple of years back. That's absolutely right. Uh, and we are totally committed to helping them do that. So the Tourism Alliance, do they have a different strategy or do they have the same strategy? No, our, our uh, strategies are both aligned, um, but the figure that, that Why you Why do pick, we need two bodies to do that? Well, one's an industry body and the other one, the other one is the, uh, the NDPB. It's just, I just, because I mean, we've had conversations about numbers before and uh, how we're going to grow tourism by 50% by you know, in five years or whatever it was. That is a very ambitious program. It's 166 million, if just, we would just cut it by year, 166 million pounds a year. It's a challenge. Without, but, wish, well, but it's, it, without wishing to put you on the spot, are we going to achieve it? I think we, are, we, are, we have a great platform and, and we're looking at 2020 and it's all about building on that platform. Uh, it, I think if you look at the, the figures over the last five years, which by and, by and large have, have been fairly flat, uh, which I accept, but I did actually have a look at one of our nearest competitors just uh, across the water, uh, and they, um, at, at their lowest point, had a, a, a fall of 25%. So I think that what we've managed to do is come through that particular storm in a fairly strong position. 
And that's borne out also by all the various reports that we've seen recently, I referred back to the FSB report, which actually said that you know, the majority of their members are actually confident and looking for future growth. There was a report from Barclays that talked about you know, the, the increase in value of tourism over the next sort of period. And then on top of that, Scottish Chamber of Commerce came out and they had also um, uh, you know, canvassed their members. And again, that confidence is there. So we have a great platform, but it's all about taking the opportunities. And I come back to the point I made earlier. You know, we can set up the opportunity, but we've got to convert them as well. Which is why I asked the question about who's doing the selling and who's leading that. I just want to ask a question, can you have me, uh, and probably directed to Mr. Nielsen, in terms of, of corporate involvement, uh, which requires, and again, the report refers to the City Convention Bureau and local authorities. How engaged are they in supporting the services which you're looking to provide? Probably, probably one for okay. Malcolm rather than well. Sorry. Well, well, the convention bureaus, we work very closely with them, with all, all the city convention bureaus, but we also <coughs> represent, uh, there are no convention bureaus in existence, we, we represent those areas. So, for example, we have uh, a team in, based in Inverness in, in our office up there that covers the Highlands and Islands. Uh, we work very closely uh, with Persia, uh, also with Fife, uh, and uh, recently uh, with, with uh, the borders, so Dumfries and Galloway and the borders. So it, it's about pulling that together, but what I would like to see is, is an industry body that represents that, that particular uh, sector, um, you know, so that you do get a cohesive approach to all of this. I mean, we can do what we can do, but ultimately, you know, it, it's far better if the industry takes responsibility uh, and is able to, you know, determine its own fate because they are in competition with each, each other. It's as simple as that. A conference will only go to one location. Uh, and as, uh, you know, I think we punch well above our weight in terms of how Scotland generally does, but I think we can still do more. And we have a number of game changers. You look at the EICC investment that's gone in, you look at the SECC Hydro Arena investment, which takes uh, Glasgow to a new level. Aberdeen's looking to invest in their infrastructure as well, which can only help. Uh, and, and we're beginning to see um, you know, the fruits of that. But it does take time. It, it's, a lot of it is about building over a number of years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of members want to come in with, with supplementaries. Can I just follow up one point first? We were talking about targets. And as you know, we, you know we, we've, in, the, in the, this committee, have taken interest in the past in the, in the target to grow revenues by 50% to 2015. Uh, you think it's time just to accept that that's now not going to happen? Well, we're always ambitious. I mean, we're always going to try and, and do the best that we can. And, and you know, um, ambition, ambition is a great thing. And, and why, why shouldn't we reach for the stars? <laughs> but it's not going to happen. Well, no, by spring 2015. Okay, okay, good try. Um, uh, Mark will be at you. Yeah, just going back to that other figure about the £1 billion by 2020, I know that's not necessarily your own figure, but you're here and the, the tourism lines aren't. Um, what's the, the comparable baseline for that? Because I've seen as well in your submission uh, £11.6 billion, but that's the total economic impact. So what's the total visitor spend at the moment? Uh, at the moment, it's 4.6 billion. 4.6 billion. So that would be about a 20, 25 percent increase by 2020. Over uh, an eight-year period. Over an eight-year period. So that's yeah. about two or three percent a about year before even the effect of compounding. Yeah. So is that actually ambitious enough? That's a very good question. Um, I, I think, it, like all of these things, it depends uh, on the context in which they were set and. Uh, when that was set two years ago, uh, the economic outlook wasn't perhaps as favourable as it is now. Mm -hmm. So uh, th there's nothing to say that you can't revise ambition, but I think you need something to aim at. Uh, and if, they, if they'd overcooked it, then it becomes unrealistic and people don't want to go for it because they feel they can't. Yeah. Um, Margaret, what are you doing? Thank you. Uh, it was a supplementary mm -hmm. to um, Mr Brodie's question. Uh, you were talking about airports at the time, and of course, um, being coming from Ayrshire, got particular interest in Prestwick. What talks have you had with the Scottish Government uh, around uh, tourism for Prestwick Airport? 
Well, the the talks that we've had are with Presswick Airport, <coughs> because and very much around uh, airlines uh, and which airlines uh, we we can actually go after and and uh, try and and bring to to Presswick. Uh, as I say, they they were also out at routes uh, in Las Vegas uh, and held a number of conversations with a number of airlines, and clearly those discussions will be ongoing. Uh, and as I said, with all the airports, we stand there and, and we will support them. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, uh, Mr Nielsen, you said you mentioned North Ayrshire and uh, this review you're carrying out. Uh, will that be part of the, the Prestwick Airport? Obviously, it plays a big part in the economy, tourism economy, particularly in, in Ayrshire. Will you uh, be including that in your talks with North Ayrshire? Um, well, the conversations have yet to begin, so it will be around the assets are there. So um, there's a potential that that's a route in, but principally it's around how do we get jobs in tourism in that area rather than direct routes to, to, to market, which is what the airport is. So there's, there's certainly a, a parallel conversation that would take place. Yeah, because obviously the economy does Correct. benefit from Prestwick Airport being there if it's working properly. Thank you. Sure, Michael. Sorry, could I just yes. a slight correction? I think Ken had mentioned Orkney has been part of the economic geography. It's actually out of Hebrides. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Sure, Michael. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, it's just to carry on with a small supplementary on the the airlines. And you mentioned earlier that um, obviously one of your priorities is the uh, international conference market and business tourism, as mentioned in your submission. Um, and you're obviously, you also talk in the paper about a number of successes, including various routes from North America and effectively the middle and near, near east. And, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, in my experience, business travellers don't like going through hubs because effectively two or three flights rather than a direct flight is obviously not uh, particularly efficient or effective and it's obviously more expensive as well. I mean, how do you tackle the problem of the lack of direct scheduled airlines, because again, scheduled airlines, scheduled routes for flights have a, a better time slots and all the rest of it. Um, how are you tackling that particular problem, and, and particularly within the European market, because effectively the number of European direct flights from Scotland and out of Scotland is, is pretty low? Uh, right. it, it's, we have a mixed strategy. We have a point-to-point -point strategy, uh, which is what you're talking about in terms mm. of uh, out of Europe. Uh, and we have a hub strategy. Um, that if I just dwell a little bit on on the hub strategy, uh, into the you, you have to also remember that that airlines are looking for profitability and sustainability. So they they need a balance of people going out as much as we want them to be coming in. Uh, and it's quite difficult, you know, for long haul uh, to to fly directly into Scotland. So you'd think the natural thing to do is to go, as in, in the past, they would come in through Heathrow primarily. Heathrow, though, as we know, uh, is at full capacity. So we have to look at another way of doing that so that they don't have two, three uh, uh, flight changes. And, and what we came up with was very much um, the, the, this arc from Helsinki all the way down through the, the Gulf states. So we have Qatar, we have, uh, Doha, we have... Um, uh, Dubai uh, and uh, Istanbul and they, they work uh, uh, if you like as an aggregator of, of people coming into those cities so that they get onto the one flight which then becomes point to point uh, and keeps it full and keeps the whole thing running. In Europe uh, it's very much about point to point and uh, what we have done is we, we've cast a net across multiple countries and I think where we're at is not so much necessarily about new routes in there is about increasing capacity and frequency uh, and make, there are one or two gaps that, that we, we've still identified uh, and we're working you know, very closely with the airports to, to try and fill those gaps but our coverage out of Europe is far greater than it's ever been Sorry, I mean that may or may not be true in terms, relatively speaking far greater than it's ever been but I mean as far as where there are no direct scheduled flights out of Scotland to Rome, Madrid, Barcelona. I mean, I could go on. But well, there are Berlin. Barcelona, but the uh, Madrid's a very good one. And Mid Madrid acts not just as a point-to-point -point, mm. uh, destination. It also acts as a hub for South America. So you've actually identified one of those missings that, that I was talking about. Um, or Berlin. 
Berlin. Berlin. There's plenty of flights with German wings and people going to, to Berlin. They don't go from all the airports. Yeah, I think, so I, th I think that's maybe what we're talking about here is, you know, do, do we have uh, equity around the country? Uh, and it would be fair to say that no, we don't. But we are, as I say, working on, on trying to uh, complete some of, the, some of that picture. And that's what I mean when I talk about increased capacity and frequency. It's not necessarily about a new flight because the flight's there, but it's maybe going from Edinburgh or Glasgow. It's how do you balance that so you get a spread across the country. Yeah, well, or, I would agree with you, but I think most people don't mind going to Glasgow or Edinburgh, but the problem is that the frequency and the timings are, are not... And that's demand-driven. Uh, so we have to make sure that that's, that's why the marketing activity is so important, because we can help create the demand in the market to make sure that, that we can actually end up with a, a more uh, amenable timetable, if you like, because uh, that, that is also an issue. You're quite right. Okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, Alison Johnson. Convener, um, good morning. You mentioned earlier that it's easier for people to get here uh, and they can do so more quickly than, than ever before because of increased airline routes. Now, um, there have been reports in the past, um, University of Oxford, don't know if you're aware of the report, predict and provide, which uh, d you know, undertook research into tourism, uh, the net tourism deficit that was actually caused by increased airline travel. And a Department for Culture, Media and Sport report. Now, this is 2004, so it's 10 years ago, but it spoke of... Now, it's a UK deficit, but they spoke of a UK tourism deficit of between 15 and £17 billion. Pounds. Um, and it very much focused on the fact that while we were increasing capacity for air travel, it was benefiting people in the UK. They were travelling out of the UK and we weren't seeing the same number of tourists coming in. And not only was it about numbers, it was about a spend. You know, a UK tourist going overseas was spending more than, than those coming in to the United Kingdom. I just wonder if more needs to be done to recapture some of those tourists for the UK and Scottish domestic market, if that might help you reach your 50% target for domestic tourism. Because those figures are fairly substantial, and I'm not quite convinced that we'll have closed that gap within 10 years. And also, there may be an impact, perhaps business travel is, is reducing that to an extent. I'm not aware of the, the, the particular report. Um, I, th I think the, 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 but from what you say, certainly the, the, there is a, a strategic approach that's actually required. And I think if you go willy nilly after every potential air route, that, that's actually. Uh, the, you, you get into the law of unintended, unintended consequences, which is why we do a lot of pre-planning so that we actually look at, um, you know, what is the balance inbound, outbound. The, in terms of actual visitor expenditure, it's really up to us. You know, if the people are here, we have to give them reasons to spend money. Uh, and, and I keep sort of saying, you know, you, you actually want to empty their wallets but leave them with a smile. You know, so <laughs> we just have to, we, we yeah, have to money, <laughs> 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 defer to your, <laughs> to your greater yeah, knowledge. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, but for, and that's about, and I think it goes back to, to Chuck Brody's point, which is about selling. It's about, you know, it's having the skills to, to, to sell, to upsell, to cross-sell. And that's something that, you know, if we really are going to maximise the benefits, then we have to be better at that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate what you say about not just going after every route willy-nilly, but is there any un research being undertaken at a Scottish level on, on what's happened, what is happening at the moment? Would that not be something that would be really helpful for, for Visit Scotland? There's a, there's a lot of re, uh, research that, that goes on before we decide which routes that, that we're actually going to go for and, and the reasons why we go for, for those. Uh, and that is then cross-matched with um, the airline's own um, research that, that they would have. And also, let's, let's not forget, they're, they're able to track um, their, uh, their customers and, and where the customers are coming from and what the demand looks like. So, it, you know, we... We do take cognizance of all the information that, that is available uh, to us, and I don't think any of the routes that, that we ha uh, collectively as a team have gone out and secured uh, would actually um, you know, sort of be put in that, that previous bracket that, that you mentioned back, back in 2004. Um, so there, there is a, there, there a, a realisation 
that if, if we're going to go out there and bring in new routes, they have to be sustainable, but they have to be beneficial to the economy as well. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Joe McClellan. In terms of transport, you talk in your, um, your briefing paper about working with Transport Scotland. Um, there's a big emphasis, obviously, and quite rightly, on, on flights and bringing people in from outside. What about internal transport links? How much work have you done with Transport Scotland in improving them? I represent south of Scotland and Dumfries and Galloway in particular doesn't have particularly good transport links. And I think I'm sure that must affect um, the number of uh, visitors that come. We, we have a very close working relationship with Transport Scotland uh, across a number of areas uh, and, and strengthened more so you know, through the, the joint working around the Ryder Cup and Commonwealth Games, uh, etc. So what, what we are about to do is, is to go into a joint session with them to actually look at all of those issues. Uh, infrastructure is one of the, the absolute key foundations of, of um, you know, from my perspective, of growing the visitor economy because people have to be able to get around the country, uh, not just into the country as quickly and possible, as possible and as conveniently as possible. Um, so we we uh, we have worked very closely with rail transporters. I think that's also in in the report. Had a very good uh, working relationship with First, First Scott Rail. Uh, already in contact with the to see you know just how how we can take that forward, uh, that new relationship when when that uh, starts. So we're very aware of, of those issues, but I guess you know the, ultimately Transport Scotland have to prioritise their investment as well. But mm -hmm. but we'll certainly be pushing you know uh, as hard as we can to make sure that you know major arteries into those areas are, are um, you know sort of invested in. Uh, would you say that Dumfries and Galloway, it's a, the, particularly in terms of public transport, the lack of electrified train line, for example, was uh, was a barrier um, to encouraging tourism? Yes, I, th I think Dumfries and Galloway s suffers slightly from its geographic location, and uh, you know, often down down there, people will talk about it being the kind of forgotten <coughs> corner, uh, despite its obvious attractions. Um, so, you know, I, I think it is about sitting down and looking at priorities and looking at how, at a local level, but also at a national level, you know, we can address some of those issues. Thanks very much. OK. Marco Biaggi, were you wanting to come back in with another question? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. I wasn't sure if you Mike, covered that earlier or no, not. But. No, no. Oh, Stuart Maxwell did a good job of it. Yeah. Um, on the, the subject of business travel, uh, We've already talked a little bit about the routes. I was quite interested in what you had submitted about the conference bid fund. I mean, I represent Edinburgh Central, so I have a little bit of a constituency interest there. One of the things that was missing was the figure for how much it was. I think I caught you saying it was a million pounds earlier. That's a spend so far. What's the total budgeted It's about 108 that? million uh, revenue generated. But, and what's the total budgeted for the fund? Oh, three million. Three million over what period? <laughs> Uh, well, it's, it was over a three-year period, right. but I suspect we'll end up um, uh, mainstreaming that activity. Right. That's quite a, a good performance uh, for return uh, on, on money spent. What kind of research is done on that? Is it the same level of, of rigour as the, the homecoming research for the, the return? Yeah, abs absolutely, and, and certainly more than happy to share that mm -hmm. with you if you'd like to have a look at it. I'd, I'd be quite interested. And... I mean, how much do the capital does the capital take of this? Do uh, I, you mention here that you know St Andrews, Stornoway, Inverness, and Perth, and I assume the hydro in Glasgow will have caused a bit of a shift there as uh, across the central belt? But you know, how geographically spread is this? It's fairly geographically spread, and fairly well spread actually. Um, we what we do find is. In many case, in cases, it's self-selecting. You know, so if if a conference goes over, say, three thousand delegates, then it, it tends to mm. default to to another location. So it's about capacity uh, in in many instances. Um, but you'll be delighted to know that my colleagues just came back from uh, the American IMEX, uh, and they you know they secured a a conference uh, for a thousand delegates mm. in, in the ICC. So. We we are you know working across all the cities and all the regions. Uh, you know it's it's not about a focus on one in particular. 
What I would say, though, interestingly enough, if you look at the breakdown of the type of conference that, that's actually been secured, um, there's a, a healthy majority that sits in the life sciences area. Mm. Uh, and, and that's the whole point about business tourism, is that you can take the strengths, Scotland's strengths in certain sectors, and apply those to, to the whole business uh, conferencing market, because there is a credibility, there's a, a reputational strength, and, and the, the two you know, are, are very synergistic. And how much work do you do with the likes of uh, Scottish Enterprise? Because I noticed in your submission as well that there was a prioritisation of the, the key growth sectors, and clearly you want people to not just come here and go away, but to make an impact while they're here and for those connections to happen. And that would seem to be their specialty. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've developed as an area of work? Yes, we try and join up the dots so that you know when you have people with, with uh, a specialism and they come into into um, whichever area it may be, that they they have the ability to to go on farm trips and look at facilities to to meet experts locally, uh, and ideally uh, to to have the opportunity to talk to to people here about inward investment. But as you say, that's very much about joining it up, particularly with SDI. Mm. And. Final question on this. It, your further submission highlighted that it was introduced as a result, a direct result of representations from Scottish destinations. Was there pressure from industry major exhibitors as well, or was it the venues largely that were pushing this? Um, I think it's a bit both, actually. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, everyone understands the potential that's there, and everyone has a vested interest in it, and I, and I think that's healthy that. Um, venues and um, uh, you know the, the destinations all want to, to get together, work together. Uh, the, I, I think the trick is to make sure that it's a cohesive, aligned plan that, that we're all saying the same thing, uh, and and that means that we'll be able to shout much louder. Okay, thank you, um, Margaret Medigo. I really wanted to ask you a question around accessible tourism. Because in your submission, you mentioned that uh, it generates $391 million for the economy, but it is a largely untapped market. So what is it you're doing to encourage more of that to come into our tourism industry? Well, we're working on a number of levels. Uh, obviously, we're working with the industry itself, and uh, there's a lot of investment that, that needs to, to go in to, to uh, the infrastructure so that, that we can um, uh, cater for, for people with various needs. Um, to do that, though, um, frankly, you, you need to build a business case uh, because people are, you know, you're asking them to invest uh, and they want to see a return on that as well. Uh, so we've been doing that. Uh, we work very closely with a number of groups who give us advice on just exactly what type of um, uh, premises or, or uh, facilities are required for, as I say, the various groups, whether it's, uh, you know, the um, uh, dogs for, for the um, uh, hearing dogs or whether it's uh, uh, guide dogs or you know, um, or, or, you know, working with various uh, carers uh, that, that are out there. Uh, we, we have to be very cognizant of, of the, the, the difference, you know, uh, that, uh, in terms of, of requirement. Sorry to interrupt. How responsive is the industry then to open up and be prepared to invest? Well, it's, it's like all, all these things. You know, there are those who, who are absolute exemplars of best practice and, and there are those who perhaps haven't seen the opportunity because they, they haven't thought about that particular opportunity. And what we've been trying to do over the last 18 months or so is to work with the industry to highlight that. We have a number of uh, people from the industry who are very passionate about it uh, uh, and who act as um, ambassadors. Uh, for for this uh, this particular area, but there's there's also a lot of work going on in Europe. Uh, the Italians are, are leading on this particular area, and we're also uh, sharing knowledge with them. Uh, we're in close contact with our, our colleagues in Italy. The Australians have been leading in this particular area for years, uh, and again, there's a lot of examples that, that can be taken out of there and brought back uh, to the Scottish industry, and and then. Uh, shared with with the industry, but 
It's, I think there is a growing realisation that uh, not only is it a business opportunity, but it's something that we actually should be doing mm -hmm. and that people you know, should not be excluded from having a holiday in Scotland because of a particular disability. Mm -hmm. But I just wonder if your partners are uh, as responsive. I mean, are they keen to encourage this type of tourism and are the skills there to provide that? Well, well, you touch on a number of points, and you're absolutely right. I mean, these things can't happen overnight. You're talking about investment, you're talking about skilling, and you're talking about um, you know, planning as well, because obviously the planning permission would be required for all of these. So we have to bring all of that together and then move it forward at a pace. Um, now, we, we've moved forward quite a lot. We had the um, accessibility statements. Uh, and, and they were implemented uh, during the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. But that's only a small step. There's a lot more that we still need to do, and it's one of the themes that we'll be carrying forward into next year and beyond, because it's not going to be a 12-month exercise, this. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Can, can I just ask a, a follow-up, if I can, on that point? Because we had a debate in Parliament on accessible tourism um, a few weeks ago, I think a number of members here have spoken. Well, one of the uh, comments that was made by a, a whole range of people across the chamber was on the question of accessibility to Waverley Station, where um, previously you, you could, uh, if, if you were in a taxi, get down to the, the um, concourse level. Out of the rain now, uh, that no, no longer available. for So people who have mobility difficulties have got to uh, travel some distance. Um, and also, uh, you get a scenario now where tourists arriving uh, are queuing in the rain to get a taxi, whereas previously they'd be undercover. Is that something Visit Scotland's had any engagement um, with Network Rail and, and, and Scott Rail on? Well, those comments were passed on, and, and uh, I think it's probably a timely reminder for me to follow up on them. <laughs> right, thank you. Okay, um, Chick Brody. Um, <clears throat> I make no apologies for coming back to the the links in the airport links, and you'll understand why. Um, I must say, in that context, I'm kind of surprised by Mr Nielsen's answer about Presswick, which suggested to me, frankly, that I would hope that Visit Scotland is much closer to what's going on in terms of the proposed capital and management infrastructure, because you play, a, or will play, a key role. But let me just ask my Captain Kirk question. New Quay in Cornwall is one of the areas for the spaceport, as are some uh, Scottish airports, <coughs> not just Preswick, but Stornoway. What engagement have you had in terms of, with all of the, and I have to tell you, I've already asked this of other organisations, so it'll be interesting to find out what links you have and what role you're playing in supporting the space project for Scotland. At this stage, none. <laughs> Uh, funny, that's the same answer I got from all the other organisations. <laughs> Should we not have somebody or a group focusing on this, in your opinion? I, th I think if it... For me, someone asked me this the other day, actually, but, um, and I was saying they, I haven't seen an awful lot of detail around it, so I've, I've heard of the concept, understand what it is that, that, that they're talking you about. You do know there's a full report being produced on this. Well, I haven't seen it, so that, that's why I'm saying... You know, I, I, thank you very much, that would be... That'd be most welcome. But I do think, um, you know, if, it, if it's a serious proposition, we've got to, we've got to look at it seriously. And, uh, and I guess, you know, I just need to get myself up to speed. Uh, talk about reaching I'm, for the stars. I'm somewhat but, concerned uh, <laughs> the CEO of, of uh, Visit Scotland is saying if it's a serious proposition. Well, I haven't seen the document, so I can't comment on the contents yeah, but from of the a, From a tourism point of view, I mean, I know we're talking long term. Surely it, it is a serious proposition. Well, I think I think it was uh, Mike McKenzie talking about you know the low hanging fruit, and and I think that's <coughs> maybe a, a slightly higher fruit to to, uh, to pluck from a particular tree. But uh, we certainly look at all opportunities. Okay, thank you. Would this be internal tourism from extraterrestrials visiting us, or is it the um, other way around? I'm not sure how the visa system works on this but, one. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, well, I think that's probably exhausted our uh, list of questioning, um, unless there's anything else people want to bring up. So I think um, that just leads me to thank you both for coming along uh, this morning. Thank you for your time, and we appreciate your input uh, as ever, um, uh, and your help to the committee with uh, our budget process.
Thank you. I will have a short suspension now to allow uh, a changeover for the next panel.
Right, if we can uh, reconvene, um, we're continuing our uh, scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2015-2016, and I'd like to welcome our second panel this morning. Uh, we have uh, three familiar faces uh, for the committee. Jenny Hogan, Director of Policy, Scottish Renewables, Dr Sam Gardner, who's Head of Policy, WWF Scotland, and Norman Kerr, Director of Energy Action Scotland. Welcome to you uh, all. Uh, as we've got... Um, written submissions uh, from you all. I'm not proposing to, to ask you to, to make opening uh, statements, uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll tease out the issues um, in terms of the questioning. Um, there are probably two broad areas um, we want to uh, address, uh, one on fuel poverty, the other on uh, support for, for renewables. I'm sure there'll be other, other areas that uh, we'll touch on too um, um, as we get through the, the session. Uh, and um, can I remind members if they would keep their questions uh, as short and to the point uh, as possible and similarly uh, answers as focused uh, uh, as possible would be helpful um, in getting through the topics in the time uh, available and I'm planning to run the session for, for, for about an hour maybe, maybe a little bit longer if if if, if time um, runs on um, and I would ask members perhaps if they would in the first instance to direct their questions to a particular panel member but then if you want to come in and add something to uh, an answer somebody else has given. If you just catch my eye, I'll, I'll bring you in as, as best I can. G can I maybe just start off then, and maybe initially address this question to Mr Kerr, um, on, on the fuel poverty uh, issue. Uh, we know there is a, a statutory uh, duty uh, under the Housing Act 20, uh, uh, 2001 uh, on the Scottish Government to eradicate fuel poverty as far as reasonably practical by November 2016. Now, this will therefore be uh, the, uh, effectively the last full budget um, uh, from the Scottish Government uh, before uh, we reach that target date. Um, in your view, uh, is there enough in this budget to allow that target to be uh, met? And, and if not, what more needs to be done? Um, I think the straightforward answer is no. Um, the budget has remained uh, fairly static over the, the last couple of years, um, and indeed over the last seven financial years, the average budget has worked out around about £60 million. Pounds. Um, that's some way short from the call that Energy Action Scotland made in 2006, where it requested £200 million pounds a year. Um, we don't believe that that has actually been attained. Um, if it has, then it perhaps over the last year or two, but it's not been consistently contained, um, achieved over that period of, of time. Um, what needs to be done? Um, I think if I was presenting a budget to my own board of trustees, um, they would ask me, does the budget meet your expectations? And I think I'm asking um, Scottish Government if this budget meets their expectations. Um, I believe the answer is they don't really know um, because there's not been a full cost analysis done by the Scottish Government on what should actually uh, be spent to eradicate fuel poverty. Uh, both ourselves and WWF and others um, have come up with varying uh, sums of money which are all there to be, to be taken apart um, by uh, colleagues from analytical services, but we have not received that type of detail. Uh, from the Scottish Government. So we've got a budget, um, but we've no idea whether or not that is fit for purpose. So you think the Scottish Government are just stabbing in the dark when it comes to the figures they're proposing? Uh, I think the Scottish Government have uh, taken account of this committee's uh, request for £200 million a year um, and latched on to that um, to try and deliver against that. I don't believe that they've made an independent assessment of whether or not that £200 million is sufficient, um, and if it's not, what uh, actually needs to be delivered. OK, and the, the £200 million pound figure, the, the Scottish Government have said that they, they, they will contribute uh, to that, and the balance will come from uh, the, uh, the, the Eco Schemes Energy Company obligation. I, I remember when we did our budget report last year, we expressed some concern about the... Um, difficulty we had in, in getting uh, accurate information as to whether uh, the amount of money from, from ECO that was expected was actually coming forward for Scotland. Are, are you clearer 
uh, now than we were last year as to what's happening with, with ECO? I think DEC and Ofgem have um, provided some figures that suggest um, Scotland achieved around about 11% um, of the ECO spend, so it seems that we are um, punching above our weight. Um, the question, however, is what that's actually going to fund. Um, and given the, uh, the current uh, ECO rules, uh, we are led to believe that that has funded, um, or the majority of that funding has gone um, on uh, houses that are connected to the gas grid to do boiler replacement. Um, so we're not actually tackling the areas where fuel poverty is is a, is is highest, which is those off the gas grid. So we're spending money. Um, that undoubtedly true. Um, we're spending more eco than we uh, might otherwise do, but it's actually what we're spending it on is is the difficulty. I mean, I, I'll bring Dr. Gardner in a minute, but just one more question, if I can. So, so. In your view, when the Scottish Government are saying that they're expecting ECO to make up the, the bulk of the £200 million, uh, that, that isn't happening because the, the ECO money is actually being spent in other areas? I don't think it will happen over the next two years either because of the right. changes to the energy company obligation. And indeed, just you know, over the past few months, um, we've seen the delivery of energy efficiency measures in Scotland um, tail off quite dramatically mm -hmm. um, because of those changes. Uh, Dr. Gardner, do you want to? Thank you. Yeah, just that? a quick point, really, to elaborate on what Nori said, which was to highlight the fact that um, the Scottish Government's acknowledged that ECO is going to be cut by approximately 50 million in Scotland. And what I would be looking for in this budget is a reflection of how the budget responds to that projected cut in funding. And given that there is a high reliance on ECO, you'd expect there to be some some means to mitigate the impact of that. And that's that's not obvious. The other thing to just flag, which is related to this, is the fact that the RPP um, projects an increase of emission savings between now and 2016 of 70% from this the equivalent line within the RPP that reads, well, doesn't automatically read across, but is the closest to the budget. And so we've got a context in which there is a cut in funding from ECO, a projected 70% increase in savings from a line which is supported through this budget, and a very clear statement from the UK Committee on Climate Change that greater resource or greater support is needed from the Scottish Government on its energy efficiency agenda to hit these targets. And yet the budget, as both WWF and Energy Action Scotland's evidence suggests, is a stand-still budget, one that doesn't seem to reflect that external context. Yeah. So, so the legal contribution is, is, is coming down and the Scottish Government are not making up the, yeah. the difference. All right. Um, I know a number of members want to come in and, and pursue some of these issues further. We'll, we'll start with Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, convener. I'm just going to pick up uh, on that um, same theme that you were uh, uh, been discussing. Um, I mean, one, one of the difficulties, it seems to me, about the fuel po poverty target is that it's actually a moving target. And I, I just wonder what the... Um, what the witnesses feel about that, both you know, in terms of energy price inflation, um, in terms of the decline in real wages, um, and what effect... I mean, I've heard from constituents who had interventions that took them out of fuel poverty you know, five or six years ago who are now back in fuel poverty. So I wonder, um, in terms of the moving target, is it realistic for... Scottish Government say to undertake a study and analysis uh, such as uh, Nori has been suggesting um, that wouldn't be very quickly out of date in any case? I, I think you make a number of uh, good points there, uh, Mr Mackenzie, but I, what I would say to you is um, when we initially looked at um, how we could address fuel poverty, there was an expectation that that would be very much reliant on housing standards and that if you uh, brought all houses in Scotland up to a certain standard of energy efficiency, then the impact of rising fuel prices or indeed lower wages would mitigate against that. Um, if you study the House Condition Survey over the past 10 years or so, what we've seen is that there has been some movement um, in, in terms of the energy efficiency of homes that has gradually increased um, that's undeniable truth, um, and indeed, if it had it not been for that, then fuel poverty would be um, at a significantly higher level. But what we have seen is that there are 
um, certain groups of, of housing that continue to be exceptionally low in terms of their energy efficiency. So to, in, in, in our view, the best way to mitigate against rising fuel prices and potentially falling incomes um, as people move in and out of employment is to actually insulate homes. So therefore, what we really need to do is set a standard and when Energy Action Scotland set the budget of £200 million back in 2006, we believe that to be um, if a home was to reach a level of a uh, national home energy rating uh, scheme rating of seven, then that would have a particular impact. That may well be out of date now, that may well be an eight now, um, but of course, in terms of consistency, um, we, we've now not reporting as much on NHER, we're reporting more on EPCs. Um, so yes, I take your, your point that things can be out of date, but unless you actually put a marker down and say what your achievement is going to be, then you have no idea whether it's out of date or not. And I think that's what I'm trying to suggest, that we've not had that marker from the Scottish Government that says we will achieve X level of energy efficiency um, for whatever percentage of homes within Scotland by a certain time. So we've, we've not got that. Um, and it's only now um, that the Scottish Government have brought forward um, a group to look at the private and private rented sector and in terms of energy efficiency standards within those areas. But that's unlikely to become legislation until 2018. Um, and it's then likely that there will be a period of introduction that allows um, people to, to bring their homes up to that standard. So we're significantly away from that. And my point, I suppose, is, yes, things can be out of date, but if you, ever, if you never actually set the marker, um, then we don't know whether we're uh, achieving that or moving towards it. I mean, that, that, what you've said, I think, is very interesting and in you know, a, a, a meaningful contribution. Um, would you agree then that um, the fuel poverty target and the way that that's expressed um, perhaps doesn't properly capture this issue and direct us to where we need to um, or how we can better address it? And, you, you know, if I, if I just perhaps elaborate slightly on what I mean by that, the you, the definition of fuel poverty is ten percent of you know income uh, being spent on fuel. Um, if you drill down and if you look at some of the studies that have been uh, done recently, for instance on Orkney, on Shetland, on Western Isles, you'll see um, perhaps the more interesting figure is extreme fuel poverty. Um, and uh, uh, would you say that um, the the previous approach of Picking the low-hanging fruit, whilst that may have been valid up to a certain point, perhaps should give way in favour of an approach that looks at dealing with extreme fuel poverty and that one of the problems from the macro perspective is when you crunch the numbers, um, may it not be the case that um, a more targeted approach uh, would actually be more effective, both in terms of reducing the fuel poverty statistics, but also in terms of capturing the, the carbon saving benefit that uh, Dr Gardner might be just as interested in? I, I, th I think there, there are a, a number of points there that could probably take up the, the rest of the, the morning. But um, I, I think that in terms of targeting, um, that's exactly what the Scottish Government are trying to do through the HEAPS programme, and that was a recommendation by the Scottish Fuel Poverty Forum that said we should move to an area-based approach, and that area-based approach should be uh, made on need and uh, encourage local authorities to come forward with projects where there was a high level of need, where the local authority um, had undertaken work, or indeed work had been undertaken by others, to show um, areas of dense fuel poverty. Um, and that was where the money was to, to be spent. You could say that that's not been particularly successful because local authorities have looked at a much wider area and said, yep, we've got an area of need, um, and there's an area of need here and there's an area of need there. They've not actually, in my mind, gone to the stage of saying, 
Is that an area of deep fuel poverty? Is that an area where we just need a lot of housing repairs? So I think we could become a bit more targeted. Um, but indeed, as I say, that's what the Scottish government is, is trying to do through the, the HEAPS programme and what we've tried to encourage local authorities to do in bringing forward um, their proposals to spend the HEAPS money because they do need to bring forward proposals um, to, to access that funding. And you'll be aware that the funding is given out in, in two parts. Um, of the £60 million pounds for HEAPS, um, there is a, a straight allocation across all local authorities. And then the second £30 million, pounds, local authorities are invited to bring forward uh, projects of specific uh, fuel poverty interest. So in other words, while the, the demand is greater, um, then there will be more money allocated to that. Um, and interestingly enough, the Western Isles punches well above its weight uh, in that particular area because they can demonstrate the need, the depth of fuel poverty, and the solutions that they've got um, to, to tackle that. On your question around whether or not we should um, move to look more at extreme fuel poverty as opposed to fuel poverty, uh, where people are spending 20 or 30 per cent more, I think the danger there is that we somehow play down the people who are simply spending 10 per cent, when actually you know, the rest of us um, and I'm, I'm speaking collectively, um, are still still today uh, spending between 4 and 5 per cent. So we, we're at, at risk of minimising um, the impact of, of fuel poverty. But I do take the, the, the point that perhaps targeting needs to be more effective. But as I say, that's the direction I travel um, that the Fuel Poverty Forum has suggested to the government. The government have accepted, and I think we just need to work with colleagues uh, in local authorities and housing associations now um, to make that much more effective than it has been just now. Okay. And, you know, uh, that, that kind of brings me on to... Um, uh, uh, can bring me on to a whole plethora of points, actually, but... Um, <laughs> You know, it seemed to me. It seemed to me. Plethora. It seemed to be me that you were you were, you were actually suggesting an approach, though, that, that that is more housing based. Treat the house rather than the person, but that in itself implies a different measure than the fuel poverty measure, which is, you know, the person. Do you spend more than a certain percentage of your income? Um, I, I, and it seems to me that you were suggesting the treat the house approach being a more rational and therefore perhaps a more effective approach. Um, Forgive me. So, so in that sense, would you say that the fuel poverty target per se that we've talked about for years and years is, you know, is a target worth aiming at, or should we be looking at an approach that's directed towards treating the house? I, I, I don't think the two are necessarily um, poles apart here. I think what we need to have is housing that people can afford to stay in, um, and if we take the opposite of fuel poverty, um, that's often described as, as affordable warmth. So a number of housing providers have worked out what affordable warmth means, um, and they've perhaps set a target based on um, levels of income derived from benefit and said, we want to achieve affordable warmth in this house type for X amount of pounds per week. And they, they've gone to say, what do we need to do to ensure that that's the case? How much insulation should we need to put in? What energy efficiency level of the house needs to be? And that may well be an approach that the Scottish government need to take in saying, if houses are to be affordable to live in and to address fuel poverty, then what is the measure of affordable warmth? So you can, you can turn it in its head, um, but the whole house approach, um, going back to what does that achieve? Well, it actually achieves your carbon savings. It tackles um, demand-side management in terms of uh, energy, uh, energy production, uh, carbon reduction. There's a whole range of things that the, the whole house approach brings, not just the affordable warmth. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just, my final question. Maybe I just want to ask Dr oh, Gardner sorry. if he had a yeah, sure. view on this. Well, just uh, very quickly, but perhaps it might be best to wait for Mr McKenzie's question and then see if it, I can follow on from that. But yeah. OK, yep. Um, the final question is a kind of linking question because I was hoping... Um, to link, we've talked a wee bit about eco, and the, the Scottish Government fuel poverty uh, measures, if I could generalise, are designed to be complementary to what the UK initiatives are. And that seems to have been, in the past, perhaps a sensible approach. 
but one given the uncertainty of eco. I mean, you know, first of all, it was stopping, then it was reduced. Now I'm not quite sure it might be back on again, um, but it seems to be a very uncertain environment affecting an awful lot of projects on the ground. District heating schemes, for instance, that have relied on an eco top-up, um, but by their very nature, you know, the pre-planning part of the, those those schemes is, you know, can extend over a fairly, a fairly long time period. Um, these are now being faced with uncertainty, but I was hoping to link this with renewable energy because energy market reform has seems to have created similar uncertainty. And, and I just wonder about this general approach um, of attempting to be complementary. I mean, it's not talked about all that much, but... Um, the, the Ross, the Renewable Obligation Scotland, was taken away. Um, that was a power that was snatched back by Westminster. But this whole general uncertainty, how do we get over that? How on earth do we provide coherent, rational support um, you know, within the budget and over a longer term that's actually going to be effective in the face of all this uncertainty? <laughs> and, and how okay, damaging can, we, can, we, have, can, we, have, can we have some fairly brief responses to that long the, the, question the, the brief response to that is not to uh, have two thirds of your budget reliant on um, eco simply to acknowledge that, that it won't deliver everything um, it's not uh, particularly well suited for rural areas where in terms of carbon saving the best carbon saving is fuel switching um, to switch from electricity to, to gas that won't happen so therefore, don't build a budget that says you're going to get two-thirds of your money from something that you know is unstable. That needs to be reflected in your budget. And indeed, as uh, Dr Gardner already alluded to, the budget this year should have recognised that failing in eco and should have um, been significantly higher. So I think when we, we set the target, um, eco was not around, um, but it was still about making houses more efficient. So... We, we recognise ECO has failings. It's had failings from the very start, and the budget should have reflected that. Sadly, it's not. Do you think the Green Deal suffers from similar shortcomings and failings? Um, the, the Green Deal suffers from many, many ailments. Um, the biggest one is, is the Golden Rule, which makes it financially unsuitable to address fuel poverty. Um, it's more uh, linked to people who uh, have money, um, who can provide the initial... Uh, capital and who can repay that money over uh, significant periods of time. The Green Deal was never about addressing fuel poverty. Um, it was simply to encourage those who could um, take out finance to take out that finance. And just in the context... Right. Right. Mike, you've, had, you've, had a, you've had a very long crack of the whip and a lot of other members want to come in. And Dr Gardner, I think, has still got to answer your previous Convener, would it help if Mr Mackenzie and I left and had a... <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Gardner. Thank you. Um, so to go back to Mr. McGenzie's first point about the, the fact it's a shifting target, um, what to be Beth would look to see is a recognition of that in the budget and therefore a change in the funding available through the budget to acknowledge the fact that the external world has changed. Um, that we've seen, as Mr. Kerr alluded to, that the, the budget has largely stayed in the region of about 60 million per annum for the last seven years. And in, the, in that wide environment, we've seen some significant changes, in particular this year with the cut to eco. And therefore, it would be reasonable to expect some measures of mitigating the impact of that reduction in eco in the budget, which we don't see. But I think your bigger point about certainty is absolutely critical to not just the energy efficiency agenda, but the renewable power sector and the renewable heat um, space, particularly where you're looking at large infrastructure projects which have high capital cost and significant risks and trying to bring those down. And I would um, like to introduce the idea that we look at the Scottish Government's infrastructure investment plan as the means of attaching greater certainty to improving the energy efficiency of our housing stock. So the, in the infrastructure investment plan, there is a line that refers to the spending of heaps, effectively. Um, but unlike other projects the way that it's described, it's not so much as an infrastructure project, but as a budget spending line. There isn't a conclusion. You don't build a bridge at the end of it. You don't end up with a housing stock that is improved. You end up with having spent this money. And there is, so you don't have the confidence and you don't have the certainty that you're achieving a particular defined outcome. And I think it would be very valuable to explore 
the role that the Scottish Government's infrastructure investment plan could have in bringing much greater certainty to that, given that this is uh, ostensibly a, you know, this is a, an a effort on the part of the Scottish Government to tackle, the, improve the public good, target funds so as to uh, cut carbon emissions, alleviate fuel poverty, it seems it's deserving of inclusion within the infrastructure investment plan. And that, I think, is equally relevant to the district heating space, which we may come on later, where there needs to be far greater certainty about what the level of ambition is with regards to district heating, where the geographical focus for that should be. And once we start to identify that, we begin to tackle some of the high costs and risks associated with where does this infrastructure go and how is it going to be funded. OK, thanks. Now, I've got a whole lot of members who want to come in on, on fuel poverty. So if we try and stick with fuel poverty first, and then we can perhaps... I know Jenny, you've been sitting there very patiently, but we can perhaps come on and talk about the other issues later. Um, Margaret McDougall first. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, just from what we've heard so far from the, the panel this morning, is it correct to say that the budget, as it is at the moment, will not help the government to eradicate fuel poverty by 2016? Yes. Yep. I think that that's the straightforward answer is yes. Yeah, okay. So, and we've heard from <coughs> Mr. Gardner and both uh, Mr. Kerr as well uh, mentioned heaps. So, the amount of pounds allocated for energy efficiency and policy implementation has fallen 9.3% from 2014-15 budget from 10.8 million to 9.8 million pounds. How will this impact on heaps? and which, which seeks to offer increasing flexibility for councils and funding? I think the, the HEAPS flexibility that you mentioned has, has brought um, a number of benefits, and, and that's to be welcomed. Um, there has been a recognition that the energy company obligation will not fund everything that it should. Therefore, uh, Scottish Government have very helpfully gone back to, to local authorities um, to suggest that they can use HEAPS in a, in a slightly different way. Um, there is a slight reduction in the budget, as, as you've highlighted, um, but again, it's back to the, well, uh, uh, no reduction is to be welcomed. It's whether or not um, local authorities in particular can use the, that budget a bit more imaginatively than they have before. So I, I'm not saying that the, it will have no impact, um, but I think local authorities have, have been given more leeway now um, in which to conduct the, the work that they want to do, and that's for the good. Mm -hmm. I mean, local authorities uh, used to have, or I think many of them had, energy efficiency officers, and because of cuts in their budgets, maybe we've lost some of those. Uh, would that be one of the ways that they could address the issues around um, fuel poverty and eradicating, you know, retrofitting, for example, as well? I think where um, we've seen local authorities being successful in applying for the, the secondary funding is where they... they still retain a, a very strong ethos in terms of delivery of energy efficiency. Um, and there is a, a, a group that, that's called the um, Energy Officers Network, or it used to be called Sean, the Scottish HECA Officers Network, um, that meets on a regular basis um, to discuss the matters of energy efficiency. Um, and I think it's of great regret that when the Home Energy and Conservation, Home Energy Conservation Act came to an end that the Scottish Government did not renew that in some way that actually placed a duty on local authorities to continue to deliver good work. Um, and just recently, Mr McKenzie um, and his uh, colleague, uh, Mr MacArthur, wrote to the Fuel Poverty Forum um, about the work in, in Orkney. Um, and the forum noted there that the, the impact of not having an energy efficiency officer for some years meant that Orkney was, was really coming from a standing start. I'm delighted to say they've now introduced an uh, uh, energy efficiency officer, um, but I think they've, they've gone backwards in, in that respect. Hopefully they, they'll pick that up and move forward. But I think, as I say, the local authorities that have done well in gaining not only additional Scottish government funding, but additional funding from ECO have been those local authorities where they're an energy efficiency officer is at the heart of their delivery in terms of their local housing strategy. So it's a very good point. Yeah. So other than finance, is that you know an, something that local authorities could do to help with eradicate fuel poverty? Yes. Yeah. 
but there's no funding available. No, um, th there's no funding available from the Scottish Government to fund um, uh, energy efficiency officers post, um, and it's down to individual local authorities whether or not they, they see that as a, a priority. Mm -hmm. um, we believe it is, and as I say, we believe, uh, sadly, that when the Home Energy Conservation Act uh, came to a, a natural end, um, it, that it was not replaced um, in, in some manner uh, that gave additional duties to local authorities. Okay, thank you. Uh, on, if I can continue well, on retrofitting... Chief has got a quick supplementary, yeah, but that's all right, just, if, if, if you're changing tack. Very quick follow-up on that. Do you have an, uh, a, a detail, a list of, by council, which ones have energy, office, uh, energy efficiency officers? And also, can you... Do we have available somewhere the information as to how much heaps money was allocated last year to the local authorities and how much they actually spent? Um, the figures in terms of the spend of heaps, um, officials tell us that all monies have been allocated and we should know by the end of the year um, whether or not it's all been spent. Um, again, helpfully, um, there, w there was an allowance of carryover so if the money was allocated, then local authorities could still spend it into the following financial year. Um, as I say, that's been helpful. Um, whether or not it's been successful, um, only time will tell. The difficulty that that has is if a local authority is allowed to spend a financial year's allocation up to September of the following year, then they start in September. That yeah. following year's budget, then they're always role, playing, yeah. they're always playing catch up. But nonetheless it allows them to be um, use their budget in a, in a better footing. Um, is there a list of all local authority energy efficiency officers? Um, yes, there is. Um, as I say, it's not the fact that, well, some don't have a recognised officer, um, some do, uh, but also where the officer sits within the council and whether or not you know they are at a particular level that reports into committee or whether they're three or four levels down the tree that and do they have agreed outcomes? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just on retrofitting, like, where are we with that? Because you know, sometimes now, since we first spoke about retrofitting, how that was important to having more efficient houses and reducing fuel poverty. Where are we with it? Because it seems to have slipped below the radar. I think, again, in, in terms of where we are, um, we if we now move to the Energy Performance Certificates, the EPCs. Um, if you look at the Scottish House Condition Survey, you will see that there is a gradual movement um, from, of, of houses moving up the scale. Um, that's to be, to be welcomed. Most houses are now a, a band C or a band D. Um, we really need them to be band Bs or band As. So we're, we're moving in the right direction but the time that has taken us to get there um, has been significant. I think back um, in 1996, uh, the average, and I'll go back to NHER now, the average NHER score was something like 4.1. It's now significantly higher. It's now 6.8 or something. So we're moving in the right direction. Um, but I've got to say the houses that, that pull that up are houses that are owned by local authorities and housing associations. The houses that perform poorest are private and private rented sector homes, which make up the majority of homes within Scotland. Um, and the, the biggest part of that private sector housing is that that was undertaken through the right to buy. Um, so people have bought their homes. Uh, the mortgage has been less than the rent, but they've not been able to maintain the, their home and invest in their home um, and that proves a, a continued difficulty in terms of trying to provide energy efficiency measures to those households. Yeah. Just to uh, put some numbers on what Mr Kerr was saying, so the latest figures that uh, we were able to lay our hands on suggest that 46% of homes have less than 200 millimetres of loft insulation, uh, still a third of homes uh, are needing of cavity wall insulation and solid wall insulation which is effectively been static since um, well there's been a 2% change since 2009 and 89% of those properties 
don't currently have some insulation to address that that solid wall feature. So there's a there's a big job to be done, and I've I've been looking for an opportunity to just hide. And I know this doesn't work on the record, and you may not or may not be able to see it, but. Um, I'll submit it maybe as supplementary evidence, but basically it's just a graph taken from a Scottish Government presentation. The blue line tells you the emissions that we've seen from the residential housing sector since uh, 1990, and the red line tells you where the RPP projects emissions reductions to go. There is and remains a very distant, uh, well, a very different trajectory that uh, we are projected to be on, um, and that highlights the challenge that both those figures that I've just uh, read out and the fact that the UK Committee on Climate Change says there's a significant job to be done if we're to match the aspirations or the, the legal ambitions of the Climate Change Act. Thanks. Um, well, obviously, the, the private sector is bringing down a, the, re, you know, the efficiency of our housing stock. So what incentives could this government provide to encourage more private sector involvement in that? I think we've seen successive governments since 1994 try to provide encouragement through the energy company obligation and its forerunners, um, through the energy assistance package that the government fund and its forerunners back to 1999. Um, it has been a sector that has been notoriously difficult to engage with, and I think we are now at a stage where we um, have provided all of the carrots to the sector. Um, we now need to look at legislation um, to encourage um, or to nudge people into moving into taking up the offers. I think it's it, it's really um, hard. If you go and hire a car, the car will be roadworthy and it will have all of the things that it needs to, to have to ensure that you are safe on the road. If you go and hire a house or rent a private sector house, there is nothing other than a fire safety certificate that says that that house will not be detrimental to your health. There are no energy efficiency standards. There's no standards in terms of provision of heating or insulation within those homes. Um, and uh, if, we're, if we're honest, in many cases, the rental of those properties that we believe to be substandard are significantly higher than local authority rents, where the local authority is providing a much higher level um, of, of standard of home. Perhaps a, an opportunity missed in the recent housing bill, then? Yes. Thank you. That's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Convener. Um, good morning. I just want to kind of come at the, the lack of action from another angle. I mean, clearly this is having a massive impact on our inability to meet our climate change targets. And you know, Stop Climate Chaos have emphasised, you know, leaky homes as one of the major areas that we need to address. But you know, impacts on people's health, children living and studying in cold, damp bedrooms. You know, there are potential savings, I feel, to be made by investing in this. And in terms of job creation, there must be huge opportunities. Has any work been done, you know, to look at the preventative benefits of investing properly in insulation? I mean, it's obviously... It, it doesn't make any sense that we're still building substandard, poorly insulated homes. Um, at this point in time and that we haven't retrofitted in the way that we need to. But could we be looking at this as a huge opportunity in terms of job creation, in terms of cutting emissions, in terms of making bills more affordable for people, you know, given the challenges with, with low wages and so on that we currently face? You want to I'll take an initial stab. Um, yes, there has been quite a bit of work done by any number of different organisations, but the one I'll just highlight, which is perhaps the most recent, is a piece of work by Consumer Focus Scotland, which highlighted that there was, um, in the region of 9,000 jobs could be created by 2027 to bring our housing stock up to a fit state. Um, there was an initial short-term job boost of 3,500 jobs. There was a reduction in gas import costs of a marine in the region of £1 billion and an average reduction in fuel bills of £505 in treated households. So that's, that's one study. WWF commissioned Cambridge Econometrics um, to do a piece of work that looked at the macroeconomic benefits to the UK of delivering on our fourth carbon budget. And that had a big piece in there about the wider benefits of improving our housing stock. Those same messages are, are echoed there. Uh, WWF has done work in the past looking at what the job creation opportunities were around getting our housing stock up to a C grade by 2020 and came to figures of about 10,000 job creation. So 
I'm sure it's possible to argue whether or not it's 10,000 or 6,000, but there are clearly health benefits to being people living in warm homes, which aren't damp, tackling asthma, potential uh, NHS benefits through the preventative spend agenda. There are job creation opportunities. And fundamentally, there is the um, incremental reduction of our reliance on, on gas as a, as a fossil fuel. Thank you. Could, could I also add that in terms of the social impacts, um, Dr. Gardner mentioned savings to the NHS. Um, Professor, Professor Christine Liddell from the University of Ulster um, a couple of years ago did work for Save the Children. And her research found that for every pound spent on uh, energy efficiency, there was a further saving of 42 pence to the NHS. So in other words, it was making homes more efficient. There was less asthma um, and other illnesses um, that, were, that were out there associated with living in a, in a cold, damp home. And indeed, um, some, some other work done, I think, through uh, Marmot, I may be wrong, um, but that suggested that the excess winter deaths in the UK, around 40% of excess winter deaths, could be directly attributed to living in cold, damp homes. So we know that there is a health impact there. Um, and as I say, Professor Liddell's work uh, shows that if we invest in energy efficiency, then there is a positive impact, um, a further saving to the NHS. Okay, um, thank you both for those comprehensive and uh, I think very useful responses. Um, I just have one more question, convener, um, to Dr. Gardner, and it is about your, you know, your point number one, that improving the energy efficiency of our housing stock should become a national infrastructure priority. Um, I couldn't agree more. Do you think that's not happening because it's it's very difficult to to unveil a plaque saying, you know, we we have addressed fuel poverty in this country? Is it not happening because it's going to take more than one government term? You know, this is going to. This is going to be, um, it should be, it definitely should be a national infrastructure priority. Do you think through educating people about the importance of it, politicians will feel more able to invest properly in it? You know, a, a sort of awareness raising campaign about what needs to be done and why? Uh, I think um, we've just outlined in a, in a very kind of overview fashion the, the real substantial public good benefits to tackling our housing stock. Those are strong arguments that any government should get behind and give certainty to the achievement of, whether it be job creation, import reduction, health improvements. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very good question and one that could perhaps be directed to the Scottish Government when they come before the committee um, as to why it is that we have a situation whereby the Scottish Government puts priority on and the right level of ambition attached to improving our housing stock, but haven't translated that into a clearly funded package that will give confidence that it's going to actually be achieved. And yet we see the similar level of certainty given to other infrastructure projects, um, whether that be a bridge or a road development or something else. Why is it, and you're, maybe you've touched on something, you know, there isn't a, a plaque to be opened once you've retrofitted every house in Scotland. But what you do have is household income better off, as we said, job creation, better health in those places, tackling the fuel poverty. It's clearly in the public good to give the certainty to that agenda and the infrastructure investment plan is, a, is the appropriate place to kind of lock it down. So I would encourage the committee to explore that if you feel it appropriate with the uh, minister when they come before the committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chick, really? Just very quickly, what would be the total cost in terms of improving the housing stock to eradicate fuel poverty? What's your estimate? If you go back to the very start of my evidence, that was what I was calling upon the Scottish Government to come up with the figure. Um, I think that figure is, is unknown. Um, we can certainly take a stab at it. Have a guess. Ten billion. I, I think we, we have an opportunity um, in the not too distant future that the Scottish House <coughs> Condition Survey will be released um, by the end of November, beginning of December. Um, within that, there will be figures on the level or the numbers of fuel poverty. There will be figures on the energy efficiency of the housing stock. And I think from that, um, it's it certainly within uh, the Minister's gift to ask the colleagues who put that together in analytical services to come up with a figure that says, if all homes were to be reached 
you know, to reach a certain energy efficiency standard and to tackle levels of disrepair, how much money would there be there? So uh, it, it, it's, it's a figure that can be worked out and worked out relatively easily um, by, by officials. And what I'm suggesting is we've not done that up until now. So my 10 billion, um, in terms of confidence, I would say plus or minus 50%. I could, uh, wait, a report that we commissioned, <laughs> which is now three years old, said... Uh, just hope it's no plus. <laughs> it's, it said 7 billion, but that was three years ago and things have changed. So I think Mr Kerr's estimate seems very accurate on the basis of that evidence. Okay, um, Stuart Maxwell. Yeah, thanks, Kavira. Um I, I mean, I, I sympathise with um, much of what's been said in terms of where we'd like to spend money. Um, but what my question is is fairly straightforward. Um, there are a lot of comments about the cuts from Eco. On Eco, the, there's been a lot of calls for the Scottish Government to mitigate the cuts from Eco and from other UK Government uh, budgets to the Scottish Parliament. Um, the kind of money we're talking about is substantial millions of pounds that would need to be mitigated, if we want to use that word. So where do you suggest we take the money from to fill the hole that you want to fill? Because it's got to come from somewhere. I think indeed it, it, it does have to come from somewhere. Um, what I would suggest to you is about determining your priorities um, and where you, as politicians, um, want those priorities to be. Um, yesterday we had the Minister opening the average speed cameras on the A9, um, and I'm not sure how much that particular project cost. And he talked about the deaths on the A9 and deaths in road traffic accidents. I will say to you that in Scotland there are 2,500 excess winter deaths every year, significantly more than there is in road traffic accidents, but we've invested are chosen to invest um, in road safety. That's not a bad thing. Um, we built a new fourth crossing, um, and I remember being at a, a meeting um, where one of the people on the fourth crossing said that the cost of repair to the old fourth road bridge um, would have been possible at a much lower cost. So there are two projects. Um, luckily enough, you don't have me to decide on your budget, because clearly you have said that we should take money from somewhere else Absolutely. and we should spend it. And, and the, the two you've come up with is, and I have support the average speed cameras, I think they've done a wonderful job on the, 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 the 77 in my area. I think they have reduced speed and reduced accidents and therefore reduced fatalities and indeed injuries in that road. So you're saying we, we should not invest in road safety and we should not invest in a bridge, a new bridge over the... Fort. I'm not saying we shouldn't invest in them. What I'm saying is it's the level of investment that you're putting in. Um, so, therefore, yes, you do need to make decisions, and whether or not that comes from other areas, I'm not aware of all of the budget areas. I can simply speak about the budget area in terms of energy efficiency. I have no idea what the budget area is in terms of education, social care, um, roads and infrastructure. It is a difficult decision to make. What I am saying to you is I'm making a plea for you to consider whether or not saving lives through energy efficiency is one that you want to invest in. And I'm suggesting to you that anybody who comes to the committee and says we should spend more money has to understand that a committee who suggests where more money should be spent must also suggest where the money comes from. And I'm asking you for your opinion on that. I, and I, and I, I go back and say to you mm -hmm. that I'm not aware of all of the budget lines and I'm sure as a committee you will have taken evidence from a range of people um, in terms of the, the budget lines that they have. Um, it is your job to listen to those pleas, and if you are to make suggestions, then there are areas. If I go back to the fourth road bridge, um, I have no idea what the budget on that was, £400 million, perhaps. Um, that £400 million or, or more. One point £1.7 billion from memory, I think. Than that, yeah. Um, that goes some way to meet Dr Gardner's six billion. So um, there, there was a budget headline. Unfortunately, that money is committed now and is, is being spent as we speak. So you can't take it from that? And, it's, and it's capital only? Can't, can't take it from there. But what I'm suggesting is 
um, you do need to look at all of the other budget headlines and as politicians make that decision. I'm making a plea that the £79 million that you've allocated is not enough if you want to eradicate fuel poverty. Mr Gardner. Um, to echo and uh, reinforce Mr Kerr's message, but to also uh, highlight the, the legal uh, context in which both the fuel poverty targets and the climate change target sits, and the challenge on the part of the Scottish Government to give confidence to a committee such as this and to stakeholders that their budget that they've attributed to achieving those targets is adequate. And I think we don't have that. And in the absence of that, we are justified in the and in, also in the you know with the evidence that we do have of calling for additional funds the the onus is very much on the scottish government to make the case that either the funds that they've committed are sufficient and to set out the evidence as to how they feel that they're going to achieve their emissions reductions targets and their fuel poverty ones or to come forward with additional funds from elsewhere within their within the, the scottish budget in its entirety and just as Mr Kerr said, we don't have sight of, we don't profess to be experts across the breadth of the Scottish budget and we're not able to identify where it is that additional funds should come from other than to say that these are legally binding targets that the government has to give confidence to everybody that they're doing all they can to meet them. I think legally binding targets. Okay. Right, have we done fuel poverty and uh, if so, uh, Perhaps we can move on because Jenny Hogan has been sitting very patiently through all this. Yes, Chick Rodney. We talked about the spending on heaps. <coughs> and I asked Mr Kerr. Uh, in, in terms of the process, I mean, we talked about if they don't spend, if the councils don't spend it now and it rolls over. The whole process from beginning to end, what are the obstacles? Why aren't we moving faster? And getting, I mean, I've, I've just had meetings this week with councils in Ayrshire about benefits now being stretched, your know, payment benefits being stretched out. I mean, is it just a resource problem? Is it a process problem? But I don't understand why we can't get you know, resources and monies to the front that are there, that are allocated to the front line a bit faster than we currently are. I think there are a couple of points there, um, Mr Brody. The first one, I go back to the, the comments I made to, to uh, Margaret McDougall. Not all local authorities have an energy efficiency officer that can bring forward uh, plans to deliver on those. So some local authorities are um, quicker to put in applications than others. And that then goes back to once you've got the allocation of the money, um, whether or not you have a straightforward procurement processes in place that you can go out to tender, bring forward the, the, the contractor, allocate the money and spend that money. So there, there are a range of reasons why um, the money is, is not getting out the door as quick as it can. Um, I, will, I will, will say to you that the Scottish Government have said that they would hope to be in a position to give allocations to local authorities for the 2015-2016 year um, by the end of this calendar year. So they would know that in advance. In previous years, they've known that May or June, so it's taken them time then to get processes running. The Scottish Government have tried to bring that forward so that local authorities are aware of their allocation much earlier. So if I told you I know of a council that hasn't, didn't spend any of its heaps money, uh, why would they get an allocation? Why wouldn't they be penalised for not doing that? I think, first of all, they would have had to have made a good case to get the heaps money. They would have had to have demonstrated that they um, had gone through a process of identifying a, an area and identifying the works within that area. Um, the reason as to why they've not delivered that, um, the council would need to be asked. Is there a penalty there? I don't believe there is, um, but I think the Scottish Government may then, in the allocation of future funding, want to be more certain of the, the actual ability to spend rather than just um, making a bid for money. Okay, thank you. Um, John McCall. Thank you very much, Convener. It's obviously clear in this area that the Scottish Government doesn't have full powers. Um, we've talked about the, um, the diminishment of eco. It doesn't have any powers over that. And in the, in the SPICE submission that we've, uh, we've got, it, it mentions that information on private sector eco-investment in Scotland is held by Ofgem and there's no specific information 
published on the cost of eco in Scotland by Ofgem. So um, I'm asking you as organisations concerned with fuel poverty, have you made a case, for example, to the Smith Commission about Scotland getting more powers over energy so that we can kind of the full gamut of powers to tackle this particular problem? The Scottish Fuel Poverty Forum, um, on a, which I'm a member of, is in the process of pulling together a submission to the Smith Commission. Um, that uh, submission is not yet finalised, so I'm afraid I, I can't give you a flavour of, of what it might or might not suggest. Um, but it's a very difficult area that you talk about because we're, we're in a, a GB market, um, so it's difficult to understand what additional powers um, that the Scottish government would have that would not have a negative impact um, elsewhere on consumers. And just to add, um, we find ourselves in a very similar situation whereby we're um, in conversations with Scottish Environment Link and with coalitions such as Stop Climate Chaos with regards to our submission, and it's not complete, so I wouldn't be able to say. Um, similar to what my colleagues are saying, however, what I can say is that Scottish Renewables did produce a paper um, um, a few weeks back now on the kinds of asks that we might be looking for, which again we would be we're, we're currently reviewing in, in terms of what we would put to the Smith Commission. But areas like off gem accountability of off gem to the Scottish Parliament is one of those areas that we've been focusing on and that we did uh, come out and, and, and talk about a few weeks back. So um, along those lines, I think is what we'll be working on. Okay, if we've done fuel poverty, perhaps we can move on to talk about some of the other issues. Um, maybe I could ask you, uh, Jenny Hogan, um, looking at the um, uh, Scottish Government's support for renewable energy in, in terms of the, the, the budget 2015-2016, we see um, overall an increase. There, there's quite a substantial increase in the capital sum going into uh, energy, some of which will be uh, in support of the, the new uh, KRS uh, Local Energy Challenge Fund. There's also been a, a reduction in the fossil fuel levy uh, the renewable projects line. Overall, can you just give us a flavour of, of Scottish Renewables' view on, on the Scottish Government's approach and how these uh, figures have been, have been going? Um, I think broadly speaking, I would say firstly that we've welcomed a lot of the investment that has come through from the Scottish Government um, in recent years and at least some of the text anyway in, in the draft budget is indicating that they um, appear to be going forward in similar areas, be it um, investing in innovations in offshore wind, um, wave and tidal technologies, the CARES fund that you mentioned. Um, we certainly want to see more of those um, continue. Um, the National Renewables Infrastructure Fund, for example, in Ports and Harbours, we've, we've seen a lot of good investment there and we need to see more of that continue as well. Um, probably the one area that I would um, add as a, as a plea for a, a more of a step change in investment is on renewable heating. So again, similar to what my colleagues have already been discussing, renewable heating, district heating, these are areas that we're, we're still very, very far off our targets and where we need to see um, a lot more focus um, from the Scottish Government to, to make a difference in that area. Um, my, so probably my last point I would make, though, is that all of this does obviously sit in the context of um, UK-wide support schemes and, again, really the Scottish Government's uh, support in terms of working with the UK Government and at times putting pressure on the UK Government to get further foresight into um, targets beyond 2020 for renewable energy and uh, budget lines. So, for example, the Renewable Heat Incentive is, is the main driver behind renewable heat technologies. Uh, we need to see some foresight on a budget for that beyond 2015. And, of course, the levy, co uh, levy control framework for um, contracts for difference, we need to see what's lying further ahead in the budget for that beyond 2021. So while that's starting to stray out of the Scottish budget, obviously these are areas that we, we need to be working across the UK um, because, ultimately, the most important things for building the Scottish supply chain in renewable energy and, indeed, exports, which I know is, has been one of the focuses for this committee, um, is about getting visibility and volume in renewable energy um, over the, the years and indeed decades ahead. So fundamentally, we need to see that the budget lines um, right across the UK set um, for those so that we can, we can allow the supply chain to invest further down the line. But in terms of what Scotland specifically can do, uh, more of the same um, across the, the field, but particularly on renewable heat, we need a, a, a more of a step change there. So Talk about a step change. I mean, if we're looking at, um, for example, district heating, the government has made additional sums available for the, the district heating uh, loan fund. Do you think they need to go further than what's well, currently I, being offered? 
I think certainly, yeah, there has been an increase in, in focus from the Scottish Government um, recently on district heating, so that is very much welcome. But I think just in terms of the scale of the, the challenge of, of going from we're about 3% of our renewable, uh, of our heat coming from renewables, and we need to obviously get up to 11% by 2020, it's a huge job. And at the moment, it's um, we, we just need a bit more confidence that that level of investment will continue to increase. Um, and I would echo what Sam said earlier about um, network infrastructure and that that really does need a large um, amount of commitment to, to help private companies to invest in that sector as well. I'm interested in terms of this you know, renewable heat target. I mean, how much of that do you think will be delivered from uh, district schemes as opposed to you know, just individual properties investing in in re renewable heat initiatives? Depends really what kind of fuel is being used in the district heating schemes as well. Um, obviously, district heating doesn't necessarily mean renewable. Um, we as an organisation support district heating in general because we see that even if it doesn't use renewable fuel initially, it can progress to that further down the line. So the infrastructure is very important. So it's hard to put a figure on that. Um, district heating, though, fundamentally will be very important, but it won't stretch right across Scotland. Obviously, there are areas, more rural areas that are using particularly high carbon fuels at the moment, which are unlikely to be tapping into those schemes. So we really need a, a mix of, of different solutions for, for renewable heating to meet the target. Sam Garner, uh, just to say that um, analysis that uh, WWF commissioned from Element Energy uh, echoed conclusions from the Committee on Climate Change, DEC and others that highlighted that while district heating is a real kind of backbone of a future low carbon heat network, uh, the dominant source of renewable heat will come from air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps, and they will form the bulk of our future electrified heat um, supply. And it only goes to echo the point that Jenny made about the importance of having an RHI. At the moment, it came in late. It started this year, I think, or late, uh, late last year. And at the moment, there's no commitment beyond next year. And that's no means by which companies can establish themselves in any place, develop supply chains, build skills and begin to deploy and build confidence in a consumer base that the, an air source heat pump is a, a real viable means of keeping your house warm. So having that long-term certainty is very important. District heating, um, we have a target of uh, 40,000 homes, I think, by 2020. We're currently at 10,000 homes. Um, there's a significant step change required there. Whilst the increase in funding to the district heating loan fund is welcome, I think it's important that it's one complemented by uh, some real uh, substantive effort into what regulatory framework would work to both protect the consumer with the provision of district heating, but also incentivize and create a market that gives certainty to developers that they will have the means to sell that heat. So I think there's a, there's a body of work to be done there. Um, that will only go, um, that will be, be an important part in reducing the costs that are developers' experience in trying to uh, get loans to, to finance these projects. If they can uh, reduce the risk, they'll reduce the costs. Um, but I think the District Heating Loan Fund could be complemented by a targeted development fund that bridges the gap between some of the feasibility studies that uh, are need, well, are always needed, and then taking that to investment. And that can be a substantial piece of funding. So, um, you know, a project in, in Glasgow, Wineford Estate, um, 1,800 homes, it was a £100,000 um, feasibility uh, of study to get from the feasibility study to the investment. And that's the legal ne negotiations, that's consultancy costs. Those are substantial uh, costs that are borne by the developer or by uh, the partners that are involved in it. And at the moment, the Warm Homes Fund is uh, providing some support in this area, but it has, as I understand it, it's a £10,000 uh, development fund and it's targeted at renewable only uh, district heating, um, we would recognise that the infrastructure can and will support combined heat and power in the first instance with the potential for it to take renewable fuel in time. But combined heat and power projects can't be funded under that. So there's a need to look to what extent that's, that development is being limited um, and could be opened up with a, a fund that supports the feasibility studies for CHP plants. And lastly, I wanted to raise the potential value of a loan guarantee fund or some other means of reducing the, the costs um, that are uh, part of the, the district heating challenge um, and the extent to which the Scottish Government could address those by establishing something along the lines of a loan guarantee fund to reduce those capital costs. It's 
wherever you look across Northern Europe and you've seen district heating rolled out, that has been coupled with regulation. That has been the building blocks of uh, putting in place infrastructure that is then able to be refinanced and the Scottish Government get a return in time on it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to ask Jenny and Sam uh, a question about district heating networks. Uh, but just coming back to the point made earlier about spending priorities and the question that Stuart Maxwell made, I was in uh, uh, London last week when the HS3 was announced, uh, which will cost about £4 billion and save 15 minutes on the journey. So, you know, given the constraints and the, con the structure that we have, uh, there is a difficulty that we have, have to, to face. Um, in terms of district heating, you know, when I did the, the exercise, uh, and Margaret loved this, that proved there was oil and gas in the Clyde, I had discussions with people who had been involved in the coal network and also looked at the, the coal mines and where they are across Ayrshire and indeed into, into South Lanarkshire. What work has been done in developing geothermal heating networks? No, I, don't. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have a lot to say on it and, and that not an awful lot at the moment but I know it is an area that um, some of the universities in Scotland have been looking at and doing quite a bit of research on um, and it is something that I know the Scottish Government is looking at but I don't have an awful lot of information on the level of detail so as far as I'm aware I'm it's very early stage I'm told there's loads of warm water flowing through mm. these old mines uh, and if you think of areas like you know, Patna, Delmellington what have you, that could benefit from a district heating network by tapping into it. Yeah. It no, could be quick. Absolutely, I agree with that, and that there are definitely some uh, <coughs> some um, opportunities out there. We recently ran an event uh, with Strathclyde University looking at uh, heat from rivers as well and, and some of these new innovative technologies that could be used. So it is an area that's being looked at, but we absolutely need to make sure we're continuing investment in universities and you know innovation schemes to to get these kinds of projects from the ground up and running and, and uh, see some prototypes come through. Sir? Just to, to make Sorry. somebody aware that there's a, an excellent um, geothermal project Shettleson. in Shettleson. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, why that's not been replicated, uh, again, I think it's down to the, the money that's made available to do the, the feasibility study and then undertake some of the very high capital costs um, of, of drilling, etc. So um, there are some very good examples out there. Um, and again, Glasgow, Kilmarnock, uh, and places like that are, are riddled with old coal mines, yep. flooded with, with water that can be used. We, we do have the technology, we have the know-how, it's just been able to replicate them. And I think the point that Dr Gardner made um, on district heating, again, we do have the technology, um, it's about replicating that. Um, and if you think that um, Aberdeen Heating Power, which I can speak about as a, as a trustee, um, has been going for 10 years, uh, and we've just signed up our 2,000th our, uh, customer, um, but that's taken 10 years. So again, the challenge there is finding the way to support um, the, the growth of those projects and, and the delivery of those projects. Um, so there's stuff out there. It's just how we um, give the financial signals, not necessarily the funding, but the financial signals and the long-term viability um, that investors will need to bring forward uh, private funding. Which well, kind? Of Sorry, kind. Just very quickly, <coughs> just to um, make two points. One, um, I think the drawing on evidence or submissions that the Edinburgh University made to the Scottish Government in their draft heat generation policy statement, they've shown with evidence the value of spatial zoning, which geothermal lends itself to because it's in a particular place, um, and how that is a prerequisite for the large-scale development of of the district heating infrastructure. At the moment, what we have, whilst the district heating loan scheme is very welcome, we it doesn't lend itself to strategic growth of an infrastructure that allows other networks to connect to it, that puts in place oversized infrastructure that allows for growth because you can only fund it to the scale of what you're actually currently doing. So there is an important role for the, maybe the national planning framework, for again, for the Scottish Government's infrastructure investment plan to identify where it is that district heating and we have the map we have a heat map now of scotland we have a, an awful lot of detail um where we identify where district heating is an appropriate uh, piece of infrastructure where it will reduce costs uh, to people's bills and 
targeting that allows people to operate with confidence that there's going to be a market in that place. And if you look at, like I say, if you look across Norway, where they've had an e-heat at, you look across Denmark, where they've provided certainty that there's going to be connection, they've, that's followed with investment. And in, you know, in Copenhagen, 98% of people are connected to a district heating network. That might not be right and proper for Edinburgh or Glasgow, but there's nothing to say that there's a technological barrier to this. What Scotland is envisaging exists elsewhere in Northern Europe and ought to be able to be mimicked. Um, and the final point I would just say, um, ex this is, uh, I appreciate that the committee very much has its work plan uh, mapped out, but district heating, I think, is an area of significant complexity. It's perhaps an area that's requiring of, uh, well, it's certainly requiring of regulation, it's requiring of innovative finance methods, it's large infrastructure um, that will have long-term impact, has to grow strategically across Scotland if it's not to lock in per first consequences, and it's perhaps an area that the committee might want to return to at some later stage, as this is a uh, priority of the Scottish Government's. They've got a district heating action plan. They will shortly have a, a heat generation policy statement that puts a lot of priority on district heating. Um, and there are others out there, not least those colleagues at Edinburgh University, who, are, who have a rich bed of knowledge that would, uh, I'm sure, be of interest to the committee. If I, just last question, if I, when I worked in, in industry and commerce, uh, I remember going to my managing director with a, a situation saying, I think this is the situation. And his answer was, I've got enough thinkers, what I need are doers. Now, given the state of commercial money you know, and the, the cost of commercial money, which is not high, uh, and, and it's fine we're doing all these reports and what have you, but it's already proven. How do we, or where do we get the leadership to go and attack yeah, an opportunity. It's not a problem, it's an opportunity. Uh, and follow through on the funding mechanisms, the organisation. I mean, where does, that, where does that come from? I mean, you all do great jobs in, in, in the roles that you're in. Uh, but, you yeah, know, where is the, the leadership on, in that particular area, for example, in terms of looking at funding? I have another situation with, I was going to ask a question about Marine, but... Uh, in, in, with, with a company that has developed new submersibles, uh, which, you know, and looking at their efficiency, huge. But again, it's a question of saying, yeah, how do we lead? And, and we, we, we can get foreign money. Mm. Where, where does, where, where does, have we got too many organisations in, in this field or what? Uh, Brief. Yeah, very briefly, I will Sorry. just highlight that in the Scottish Government's draft heat generation policy statement, they commissioned Arup to do some modelling of what would be required in order to grow Scotland's renewable heat base. And unfortunately, the actual study didn't come out during the consultation period, it came out afterwards, but what they looked at was two axes of high government intervention and uptake. And the only scenario in which both the long-term costs are, you get basically a return on that infrastructure, you achieve your emissions reductions targets, is a scenario where there is high government intervention coupled, and as a consequence, you get that high uptake. So I think in the first instance, and again, this is what's reflected around Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Austria, is leadership has come in the first instance from the government, from the national government, to signal a priority on a particular area, to put in place a regulatory framework that has reduced the costs and, give, and created a market in which developers can be confident that they will get a return on a, a large piece of buried asset, basically. Penny? Yeah, just briefly picking up on that, I would, I would agree, absolutely. And I mean, you kind of briefly mentioned marine there, and you can look at the marine industry as, as a, an example that is obviously still growing and developing, but the Scottish Government obviously has shown a lot of leadership in that area. Um, a report recently showed that I think with every one pound of government uh, public funding, um, the marine industry have leveraged six pounds of uh, private investment. So uh, absolutely, it's that kind of, of leadership from government ultimately that needs to be coordinated right across the whole heat sphere, which I think you rightly alluded to is very complex. There's a lot of different organisations, a lot of different sectors interested in this area. Um, these three, just some examples, but um, it, it needs, it needs, I think, government leadership to really pull all that together. Thank you. Okay. And lastly, and hopefully fairly briefly, uh, Mike McKenzie. I don't think there's much chance of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was interested. I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm going to make an offer to Dr Gardner. Um, I'd be very happy to give you 
an almost new air source heat pump, free of charge. It's yours for collection. Um, the story work. with that heat pump in common with a lot is that it worked for approximately one day and then couldn't be made to work again. And similarly, I've got a large file in, in my inbox uh, of constituents who have been early adopters of ground source heat pumps, um, wood pellet stoves, and as you'll know, they're all guaranteed um, by the, because you mentioned confidence being important, and the UK government scheme, the MCS scheme, um, which consumers take as some form of guarantee, is no such thing. Um, it's not worth the paper it's written on. And when you analyse the problems, they fall into two categories. They fall into the category of the appliances not being fit for purpose. They're, they're, they're guaranteed, supposedly, by the MCS scheme. And they fall into the other category of the installers not being up to the job. And once again, the guarantee that the UK government provides is the MCS approval of the installers. And again, that doesn't seem to be worth much either. Would you agree with me that, that it's critically important that this UK government MCS scheme is made fit for purpose if we're going to persuade consumers to take up these various technologies that can both help reduce fuel, fuel poverty and meet our carbon targets? And then in the face of that scheme not being fit for purpose, it's extremely difficult for the Scottish Government to achieve the renewable heat target. Yeah, go for it. It's down to me, but I'm happily doing. Um, all, all I would say is that yes, there have absolutely been difficulties with the MCS. It's been an issue that we've been concerned with, and yes, we would obviously um, be keen to make sure that that scheme works because it has to work to ensure that the uh, installations are, are or, or the public have confidence in those installations. Um, but it is still only part of the picture as well, and that it is just the domestic or, or business scale technologies. And, and when you look at including things like district heating, maybe that is an area that the Scottish Government can do more um, in terms of providing that leadership. Um, so it's, the, it's a, a complex picture, but I would agree with, with the point about the MCS. Yeah, thank you. And, well, just to uh, echo that, but also to say that if the MCS is failing in that regard, then it's failing the UK, which equally has renewable heat targets. Indeed. Uh, the Scottish Government, uh, I know... Working, Energy Saving Trust has done a piece of analysis that looked at what the effectiveness was of air source heat pumps in different property types. Building an evidence base and advocating for improvements to an accreditation scheme or an MCS scheme, that will give greater confidence to the rollout of these technology types is clearly very important. Okay. Jenny, Jenny I wants to come back in. Just briefly as well, uh, um, in relation to that point, um, air source heat pumps is, is a technology that, um, as Sam has mentioned, is, has a, a big future ahead of it. The um, National Grid scenarios show that um, heat pumps in general are likely to um, provide a big part of the, the sector's um, growth. The, there is one area that the Scottish Government could be doing more, I think, in that area is on the planning side of things, where actually the rest of the UK is uh, leading on, on providing air source heat pumps, uh, permitted development. The Scottish Government, though, unfortunately, doesn't. So, again, that's an area that we could, we could be working a bit harder on, I think. I absolutely agree with you on planning. Um, again, just on this theme of certainty, though, and confidence... Um, I'm sure uh, Dr Gardner will agree with me. You referred to the domestic RHI, the commercial one's been in, 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 in operation for a number of years, but the domestic one um, was delayed and delayed and delayed. I first heard of it oh, 10 years or so ago, um, and that you know, both installers and consumers who were hoping to install these technologies um, do their bit for the environment and so on um, were were perhaps sent the wrong kind of market signal, especially especially when you consider that what the UK government did to solar PV when they reduced the feed-in tariff from 43 pence overnight to 24, and then the ink had hardly dried in the paper and it was reduced to 16 pence. And when you look at um, small-scale hydro and regression, degression rather, and how that's a... I, I think one of these new made up words, degression, but um, how that affects the viability of these schemes, that's if, if or when they may get grid access. Um, surely, question, yeah. surely, surely in terms of us taking forward this agenda 
Um, we need the UK government to provide confidence and certainty. And given that the Scottish <coughs> government's position is to try and provide complementary funding, don't you have some sympathy for the job of the Scottish government? How difficult it is to, to bring forward these good things that we all agree ought to be brought forward in the face of such uncertainty coming from the UK government. Surely that's the biggest factor. Um, I can pick on that first. Um, basically, that just goes back to my initial one of my initial three points was that yeah, of course we are in a, a, a GB market and that we do need leadership at the UK level. Um, so absolutely, there's a role for the Scottish government there in working with the UK and where necessary, putting pressure on the UK government to ensure that we have foresight of targets. So a decarbonisation target, ideally a renewables target for 2030, um, and a foresight of the levy control framework. Um, further work on the hydro degradation, which you rightly add, is, is something that's actually been reviewed next year. So we, we'll be working very hard to make sure that um, becomes fit for purpose. At the moment, it's not. Um, so, and of course, the RHI is another uh, example of where we, we need site beyond 2015 that we've mentioned already. So, yes, it, it's definitely something that the UK government needs to um, work on. And there's a role there, I think, for the Scottish government to uh, work with them and, and put pressure on them where necessary. Okay. Dr. Garner, come on. Come on. Okay, fine. okay, right. I think we'll have to call it a day at that. Um, it's been a good session. Uh, thank you uh, all for coming along and assisting us with our uh, budget scrutiny, and we're grateful to you okay. for your contribution. Uh, we'll now have a short suspension uh, before we move on to next business, which I think is in private session.